It's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker. Aidan Curran is a biomedical engineering major at Rowan, and he will be sharing his work entitled Physician Assisted Suicide, America's Quandary. Thanks, Aidan. Hi, everyone. Thank you for uh, coming today and listening to me speak. I thought I was a little outside my depth after those presentations, so take it easy on me while I'm up here. <laughs> But we're talking about physician ass assisted suicide today. Uh, what inspired me to focus on this was this piece of technology, Sarco. As you can see, it's a very pretty uh, purpley piece of technology. It's intended to be a coffin uh, to provide what Phil Nitschke, Dr. Phil Nitschke, would call uh, exit, right, the final uh, death. And the idea is that it functions off of hypoxia. Once you're inside, you answer a series of questions, press a button, and the chamber will start to fill with, uh, sorry, with uh, nitrogen gas. And so as uh, O2 levels deplete, you start breathing uh, N2 and uh, you die, uh, you fork death reportedly. The, that riddle, little red button in there will allow you to pop out. So far, uh, no uh, functional units have been made. This is intended to be 3D printed over seven months out of biodegradable material, but it can also be reused as uh, you look online and through uh, Dr. Nishke's uh, book that he puts out, it's also an e-book. They'll give seminars, uh, they'll, they're planning to reuse it. And so now they, they're currently just talking about it and how they're gonna implement it in Switzerland since that is the only legally viable country, more lax laws there. And so it's really interesting. This. Uh, brought me to a broader perspective and then I decided to try and focus in on America. I found myself overwhelmed a little bit. And so first we could talk about the terminology hospice care and palliative care. These usually go hand in hand when people are talking about end of life care. The only difference is that palliative care happens throughout your entire life, right? My knee hurts, I take ibuprofen to get that pain to go away. It's time, non-time dependent and curative, right? It doesn't matter how long it takes and there's a uh, there's an illness and trying to treat in there. Hospice care, however, is time dependent, that uh, time dependent being death, if you will, that, that's the, what we're headed towards, and non-curative, so purely just comfort care. Not intended to treat any disease, just make you feel better. Euthanasia is seen in the Netherlands, Belgium, and Luxembourg, uh, European countries, as the direct causing of another's death for the, the beneficent. So this is when the physician, PA, nurse practitioner, takes uh, the chemicals themselves in a syringe or what have you and injects it by their hand, right? This is something Americans, at least, reflected in the law, are very uncomfortable with. Instead, we have what can be uh, termed as physician-assisted suicide, providing the patient the means to kill themselves through a class of drugs known as barbitrates. This class of drugs has been studied just to stop the, the human heart, and this has been coined in the Morris versus Brandenburg case and New Mexico in 2014. Moreover, uh, there are 10 states that have similar laws. New Jersey has medical aid in dying officially. And so part of this is getting the terminology straight, right? Medical assistance in dying will end physician assisted suicide, likely covers hospice and palliative care and uh, much more. But you see medical assistance in dying might also uh, be used for euthanasia. That could also be explored. So that, that's a terminology I think that it's important to note before we start to get into it. So in the US, there's only 10 states that have some sort of physician assisted suicide or medical aid in dying. New Jersey being one of them in 2019, they put out that law. The minimum age is 18. So I think it's interesting that in this country, you can decide if you want to medically kill yourself or not, but you can't buy uh, cigarettes or, or go to a bar, right, to get a beer. It's, it, it's interesting and studies will show that the the human brain, right, is still developing in 25, 26 years, I think the latest numbers show. So that's fascinating in and of itself. Next, the diagnosis. So you need to be terminal and you need to have less than six months left to live. They don't talk about chronic pain, fibromyalgia is a big one, uh, cystic fibrosis, any sort of autoimmune dis disorder that makes it incredibly hard for you to, we talk about those freedoms in the earlier lectures, to have that total freedom in society. So that you're not eligible. For, to explore this option. 
Next is the wait time. You don't, you, just, you don't just go up to your physician and say, I want to kill myself, and they say, here you go, be on your way. It's uh, highly regulated, and uh, I personally am in favor of this. It's a 15 to 20 days between two oral requests, so you sit down with your physician. And many physicians that I have talked to are incredibly uncomfortable with this idea. And so it, that brings me into my next slide, so I won't get into that too much here. But there are two oral requests typically in the United States, and then 48 hours after you've submitted a written request. And so you can go online to New Jersey Department of Health, and all these forms are viewable there. And uh, it's interesting. I should also make it a point that uh, I'm not trying to convince anyone of, to uh, believe me or one way or another, but you certainly might see my biases come forth as I continue talking. Next is consultation. So many states will require a second physician uh, character witnesses to come from your own life to uh, solidify that you're of sound mind, or uh, even a psychiatric evaluation from a psychiatrist or mental health counselor, further certifying, yes, this person is not uh, insane. They are making their choice of their own volition with full understanding of their consequences. In uh, other countries, it might be a little bit lax, so they might not have the same age requirement. It might be open to kids. The diagnosis is less vague. It's not uh, concrete as we see terminal less than six months live and so that opens it up to a larger demographic. So from what I've been able to deduce uh, I've found two camps them versus us. So on the one hand we have do no harm which uh, is in favor of life right. The people who belong to this camp usually believe that life is a gift and that all life has the potential to be beautiful and that it should be cherished. So People here would also decide that this is a the very, very last resort. Physicians see themselves as healers. They want to preserve life. If you've uh, ever taken a CPR first aid class, nowhere in the algorithm uh, does it say stop, you wait for help. And then other people can, can make that decision, but you do everything you can, you can right to preserve life. There's also merits to this side in maintaining public trust. If you go to your primary care physician and say you want to kill yourself and they say, okay, that's fine that might start to make masses start to doubt the intent of their physician, if that, if that makes sense. And that goes along with professional standards. On the other side, Dying with Dignity and other international organizations such as Exit International, uh, that organization is run by Dr. Phil Nitschke. These uh, people who belong to this side would say that dying provides triumph to the person over their suffering. It, it's empowering to go out on your own terms. And they emphasize the patient's autonomy. And this would currently go against medical advice in some states, which is also, it's a, it, this is also a concept that's allowed in hospitals. You are allowed to leave if you don't feel comfortable with what the physician and healthcare team are doing. So this is already something that's been established in the broader sense of things. And they would also harp on your right to die. So what the end looks like for you and your family, you get to decide that. So one point I wanted to make before we continue is that a, a case study from a hospice physician compared two patients. One patient uh, was vent dependent and trach dependent. The only way they could communicate was through blinking their eyes. So the physician sat down, talked to this patient, and uh, had the talk if they wanted to end their own life, appropriately so, given that the physician was taken aback at their current circumstances. And the patient said, no, I'm, I'm satisfied with my quality of life. I want to continue living. And so the physician said, okay, then we won't explore this any further. On the other hand, a 50-year-old woman, same uh, physician, same hospice care physician, had this conversation after they were diagnosed with terminal cancer that they wanted to end it. They had saw their mother go through a similar cancer and they were, had no interest in chemotherapy, no interest in dragging their, their, out their death. They wanted to be empowered over their disease. They didn't want to have that uh, happen to them. And so it's interesting how these two patients arrive at their opinions and a lot of factors go into this. Religion, society, family units, uh, gender, sex, socioeconomic status. So future considerations. I saw a strong parallel with Roe v. Wade, uh, specifically the issue of bodily, bodily autonomy, except in, in this case, the person whose life we're talking about terminating, or whatever life we're talking about terminating, is uh, they get to have a say in it, if you will. 
next uh, for the future should be some clarity of what can and cannot happen and what certain terms mean. The Medical Aid and Dying Act in New Jersey might also include palliative care, hospice care, and physician-assisted suicide. So being clear on that is of the utmost importance. Last is vulnerability. Uh, certain countries will allow uh, children to talk about this, which is something I, I'm personally somewhat uncomfortable with. We talked about how children, in an earlier presentation, that children are totally independent and autonomous individuals. So allowing them the chance to end their, to talk about ending their own life, is uh, it gets complicated. Same thing with elderly and neurodivergent individuals. Lastly, diagnosis. I, I think it should be opened up somewhat, or at least explored, because those who live with chronic pain, with uh, autoimmune disorders, uh, I can imagine their quality of life being inhibited. And although I, I like to consider myself a resilient person, I certainly recognize that I have my own capacity for what I want my life to be and what I expect for myself. And so I only know how long I could take without meeting that. I, I know I, I would have a, an end, so to speak. Lastly, the psychosocial Im implications and cultural differences. Just in the US, uh, communities in Texas are vastly different from communities in California, vastly different from communities in New Jersey. So it's important to have that uh, localized regulation, right? We talked about local le leaders getting involved with uh, school lunches. They should also be involved with physician-assisted suicide. And lastly, I believe involving providers, opting in or out, if they want to be a part of this, uh, this idea, which is something that Jefferson and Cherry Hill did one of my physician mentors talked about when this originally came out, they, he was asked to be put on a registry and if he felt comfortable carrying this out or not. And he, he couldn't remember what he said, but I, I think that's appropriate for, to get the people who want to be a part of this process in the right, connected to the right patients. I believe the family should be involved, whatever that looks like, whatever familial units, either uh, related by blood or those you choose to be around at the end of your death because certainly they, they'd be impacted too, similar how the family's impacted by capital punishment. Uh, how the end looks, uh, again, you, uh, you get to decide that, right? I, I believe the person should be able to make a choice on how, how that looks for them, whether they're gonna be in a hospital bed or a nursing home where a lot of, the, a lot of people in America meet their end, or if it could be in a field with uh, Sarko staring out over the ocean, I'm not sure, but that, <laughs> that certainly is one of the options. Not currently, but potentially. So that, that's it from me. Do we have any questions?